We're live. Well, good day, good evening, everyone. Welcome, bienvenidos. You are here today on Cultivating Voices live poetry for our Juneteenth program featuring an anthology by editor, poet, and literary historian Kim Roberts with our and with featured guest poets reading from the anthology uh, to celebrate this significant holiday in US history. We will talk a little bit about that history as part of the program. Um, and I want to just say I'm so glad for all of us to be together. I'm Sandy Yanone. I'm your host and the author of Boats for Women for Salmon from, uh, from Salmon Poetry. And I'm so grateful those of you joining us, watching us um, live here on Zoom and on Facebook. I know everybody has access to lots of readings. And I really appreciate you in particular returning today for this quite unique edition of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Of course, the official date is June 19th, yesterday. But months ago, months ago, I received a wonderful email from. Kim Roberts um, uh, asking if we would be interested in hosting a reading around her collection. And I said, yes, of course. Um, I was quite taken by the idea of the book and suggested, and this, this was in February, how about we do something for Juneteenth? thinking that there would be plenty of people who wouldn't know what Juneteenth was and, and how could we bring that to our live, to some of the members of our live audience, because we have some inter folks internationally here that, that wouldn't know. We had no way of knowing, of course, that just the week before, uh, earlier this week, we would be, that worldwide we would be hearing about Juneteenth because it would become a federal holiday in the United States. And I hope some of you were able to watch the signing of um, the bill by President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris and, and got to see Miss Opal Lee uh, and, and see her amazing contributions to um, how she fought for years and years and years, as well as many other, many people to bring Juneteenth um, to uh, having the stature of uh, a federal holiday, which I hope will become a national holiday, certainly um, soon down the line. Well, anyway, I could not be more honored than to welcome poet and literary historian Kim Roberts to, as I said, to share her latest book with us, and the significant themes that course through this book by, by Broad Potomac Shore, great poems from the early days of our nation's capital, as well as the poetry contained in this anthology. And joining us to amplify these themes and provide the voices of the poets from the past are in order of appearance, first will be Kim Roberts, who has been the recipient of grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Humanities DC, and the DC Commission of the Arts. Kim has been a writer in residence at 18 artist colonies and poems of hers have been featured in the Wick Poetry Center's Traveling Stanzas Project on the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day Project and on podcasts sponsored by the Library of Congress and the National Endowment for the Arts. In a next in appearance, 
reading a poem from Grace Greenwood will be yours truly, Sandy Unown, uh, as I said, author of Boats for Women. Following me will be Liz All, who will be reading a poem by Gail Hamilton. Liz All's most recent collection is Beating the Bounds from Hobblebush Books 2017, and three other of her collections appear with Seven Kitchen Press and Pecan Grove Press. And her first chapbook from 2008, A Thirst That's Partly Mine, was the winner of the 2008 Slappering Hall Press chapbook contest. Slappering Hall Press, of course, another press that we featured earlier this year. Liz's poems have appeared in numerous literary journals, including Prairie Schooner, Sinister Wisdom, Measure, Nimrod, The Crab Orchard Review, as well as several anthologies, including This Assignment is So Gay, LGBTIQ Poets on the Art of Teaching from Sibling Rivalry Press, COVID Spring Granite State Pandemic from Hobble Bush Books, and show us your papers from Main Street Rag 2020, as well as an appearance in the Nasty Women Poets and Unapologetic Anthology of Subversive Verse from Lost Horse Press. She teaches writing at Plymouth State University in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Reading poem next uh, from T. Thomas Fortune, and we'll we're coming back to read another poem from the Reverend Henry McNeil Turner is Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram. Dr. Ingram is a retired professor, spoken word artist, and social activist. He is also the host of the quintessential series, Quintessential Listening Poetry Online Radio Podcast. You've not heard it, I highly, highly recommend it. Incredible incredible gatherings, um, upcoming one this Wednesday. Dr. Ingram has been a Pushcart nominee and his work has been published in scholarly journals and other publications. He is working on his next book of poetry, When Cherry Blossoms Fall on Black Skin. He lives and joins us today from the nation's capital, Washington, DC and reading Georgia Douglas Johnson's To John Brown. Joining us today is Terry Ellen Cross Davis, who is the author of A More Perfect Union. Just happen to have it with me because I often have it by my side, which was awarded the 2019 journal Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize and Paint awarded the 2017 Ohioan Book Award for Poetry. She is the winner of Poetry Society of America's 2020 Robert H. Winner Memorial Award. And her work has appeared in print online and in many journals and anthologies, including the Academy of American Poets, Harvard Review, Pank. She has received fellowships and scholarships to Cave Canem, Hedgebrook and more. And she is the poetry coordinator for the Folger Shakespeare Library also, of course, in our nation's capital in Washington, DC. And finally, our final reader will be reading from John Sella Martin. And that will be Gary Copeland Lilly, not a stranger at all to our reading series here at Cultivating Voices. Glad to bring all these poets together today to amplify the voices from the early poems from the nation's capital. Gary Copeland Lilly is a North Carolina poet currently living, writing, and playing music in the Northwest Peninsula here of Washington. And his publications include three collections, the most recent being High Water Everywhere from Willow Books. Thank you to all of our readers and of course to Kim Roberts for bringing our nation's capital to our Juneteenth celebration today with the poets. And before we, before we begin the formal program, I'd like to just turn um, this over to Kim for a special dedication for today's reading. 
Thanks so much, Sandy. Um, su such an honor to, to be on this program today. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge a, a really important um, contributor to the DC literary community and, and, and the greater uh, literary community uh, by the name of Venus Thrash. Um, Venus was a co-editor with me for many years um, of the literary journal Beltway Poetry Quarterly. Um, and uh, published a, a terrific book of, of poems called The Fateful Apple in 2014. Um, and um, I'm just heartbroken to uh, announce that she passed away uh, yesterday um, uh, from heart failure uh, here in Washington, DC at the age of 52. I'm not really ready to um, talk about her in the past tense yet. And um, uh, I, I just wanted to, um, uh, I, I think from now on, she's going to be connected in my mind to Juneteenth. Um, uh, so um, this, is, this is for Venus. Thank you. And of course, I uh, want to send out you know, my condolences. Um, I saw a picture of Venus with a hat that looks a little like mine. And so I kind of decided to wear this hat today in honor of Venus. And um, thank you so much. Uh, Juneteenth, here we go. You know, as I mentioned, when we decided to do the program today, we were, gonna, we were already gonna start with some background information. I uh, was gonna uh, have Kim share some background information. I think it's, even though the federal holiday has been announced um, during this week, and I hope that many of you have been uh, learning and hearing about the history of Juneteenth. For those that may not, I'd like to begin today's program by just asking you, Kim, to tell us a little bit about the history of Juneteenth. Sure. Um, so, um, <sighs> uh, Juneteenth is a, a, a national holiday um, celebrating the end of slavery in the United States. And the commemoration started in Galveston, Texas in eight, 1865 over two years after President Abraham Lincoln enacted the Emancipation Proclamation, um, uh, when US troops finally arrived to enforce the legal end of slavery in all parts of the nation. And over time, as the holiday has spread nation, uh, nationwide, it's taken on other historic associations. Um, in 1968, Juneteenth gained resurgence as a civil rights holiday with its convergence with the Poor People's March to Washington, DC. Um, in 1980, Juneteenth became an official state holiday in Texas. Beginning in 1991, the Smithsonian Institution, also uh, in Washington, DC, has sponsored annual Juneteenth activities. Um, and then of course, um, as of last week, um, uh, Congress voted to make it a federal holiday. Um, Juneteenth is traditionally celebrated with uh, cookouts, parades, um, voter registration drives, and the public reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. And many jurisdictions also sponsor lectures, exhibits, um, other opportunities for continued learning about the, um, uh, the themes uh, of the holiday. Um, which um, are connected to African-American culture and, hi and history. Uh, they include the history of slavery and abolitionism, um, learning about revolt and activism past and present, and modern civil rights efforts, um, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about too, including um, the push for reparations and DC statehood. You. Did you, um, did you have an opening poem that you'd like to start us out with before we go into those themes? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a poem by Carrie Williams Clifford. Um, she was a, a, an author who 
was active in Washington, D.C. Uh, around the time of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, this is a poem of hers called uh, Peril. As when some filthy sore grows menacing, polluting all the currents of pure air, dispersing its vile atoms everywhere, while with death poison tentacles they cling to our hearts' treasuries, devouring and laying waste the temples of our care, the surgeon with blade kind but firm lays bare and cuts away the flesh, foul, festering. So must the learned doctors of the state relentlessly cut the leprous sore of prejudice. Else will they find too late its rank corruption eating through the core of human brotherhood. Grim germs of hate raising our kingdom with titanic roar. That's Kerry Williams Clifford, uh, a, an author that I, I wish was, was better known. Yeah, thanks for that opening poem on kind of so many things, kind of the overture to the reading, including the themes of what we're gonna be speaking about today and hearing poems that resonate with those themes. Well, as we begin to take a look at some of those themes, we might as well start with this, this theme of slavery and abolition. And it's obvious to me through my own study and of course through um, also the reading through the anthology that Washington DC has a very, uh, an incredibly unique and special connection to the internal slave trade itself. And would you share a little bit about that with us? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so in 1808, um, the importation of slaves into the US was uh, outlawed, uh, but this did not mean the end of slave trading by any means. Um, instead, um, uh, the forced breeding of enslaved people, the illegal smuggling of free people of color into, sla into slavery, both of those things went on the rise. By 1830, Washington DC became one of two major centers for the sale of enslaved people from the mid-Atlantic states into the deep south. Uh, the other hub for this human trafficking was Baltimore. Uh, in response, DC and Baltimore also became hubs for the Underground Railroad. And um, writers responded with an outpouring of poems on the subjects of slavery and abolition. Uh, of course, writers have always uh, uh, responded to the, their, their current time period. And poetry was seen as this unique form of moral persuasion. Arguments made in verse were considered more emotional and more forceful. They could actually change people's minds. Um, so poems were almost always included in abolitionist lectures and church services for that reason. This is the poem, A Leap from the Long Bridge with a bit of an epigraph, an incident at Washington. A woman once made her escape from the slave prison, which stands midway between the Capitol and the president's house and ran for the long bridge, crossing the Potomac to the extensive rounds and woodlands of Arlington Place. No rest for the wretched, the long day is past and night on you prison descendeth at last. Now lock up and both. Ha jailer, look here. Who flies like a wild bird escaped from the snare? A woman, a slave, up, out in pursuit while linger some gleams of the day. Ho, rally thy hunters with hallow and shout to chase down the game and away, a bold race for freedom, on fugitive, on heaven help, but the right 
and thy freedom is won. How eager she drinks the free air of the plains. Every limb, every nerve, every fiber she strains. From Columbia's glorious capital, Columbia's daughter flees to the sanctuary God hath given the sheltering forest trees. Now she treads the long bridge, joyeth lighteth her eye. Beyond her, the dense wood and darkening sky. Wild hope thrill her breast as she neareth the shore. Oh, despair, there are men fast advancing before. Shame, shame on their manhood. They hear, they heed, they cry her flight to stay and like demons form with their outstretched arms, they wait to seize their prey. She pauses, she turns, ah, will she flee back? Like wolves, her pursuers howl loud on her track. She lifteth to heaven one look of despair. Her anguish breaks forth in one hurried prayer. Hark, her jailers yell like a bloodhound's bay. On the low night wind it sweeps. Now death or the chain to the stream she turns and she leaps, oh God, she leaps. The dark and the cold yet merciful wave receives to its bosom the form of the slave. She raises earth's scenes on her dim vision gleam, but she struggleth not with the strong rushing stream. And low are the death cries her woman's heart gives as she floats adown the river. Faint and more faint grows her drowning voice and her cries have ceased forever. Now back jailer, back to thy dungeons again to swing the red lash and rivet the chain, the form thou wouldest fetter of valueless clod, the soul thou wouldest barter returned to her God. She lifts in her his light her unmanacled hands. She flees through the darkness no more. To freedom she leaped through drowning and death, and her sorrow and bondage are o'er. Oh, thank you. you. You read that beautifully, Sandy. Um, it's a poem that I find particularly moving. Um, so um, Grace Greenwood was the, the um, pen name of um, uh, a, an author by the name of Sarah Clark Lippincott. Um, and um, she uh, lived in DC from 1850 to 1852 and worked as a, a governess for um, the, the leading white abolitionist family uh, in Washington at that time, um, Gamaliel and Margaret Bailey. Um, and um, uh, Gamaliel Bailey was the editor of a newspaper called The National Era, um, which is famous um, for most, to most people now as being the, the first place where um, uh, um, oh, good Lord, the, the, the famous novel that Lincoln said, Little Lady, You've Started the Civil War is called, it just flew out of my mind. Um, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Someone help me out here. Uh, the, um, oh, for goodness sake, it'll come to me. As my friend Linda says, do you need to know now or will 10 minutes from now do? Um, the, 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 uh, the novel uh, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin was first serialized in the new era. It took me that long to get through. Um, and um, uh, what the Baileys generally did was they took uh, talented younger women into their household and they, um, Yes, they were governesses to their many children, but they also um, uh, uh, were mentors to these, these young women um, as they started careers as journalists, as radical journalists. So Grace Greenwood is one of the, those people who um, 
uh, got her start uh, in the household of the, the Baileys um, writing for the, the national era. Um, but she um, became um, a, a very successful journalist. Um, she was the editor for the most popular women's magazine of her time, Godey's Lady Book, and a correspondent for the New York Times. Um, and the poem that Sandy just read so beautifully references the Long Bridge. And that was a wooden toll bridge spanning the Potomac River. So it was literally the bridge between North and South. Um, it went between Washington, D.C. and Arlington, Virginia. Uh, the bridge opened in 1809. Union troops occupied it during the Civil War. And um, a, a bridge still exists to that day on that site. That's um, now, for those of you who know D.C., that's the 14th Street Bridge. Um, and I think, um, you know, in, in particular, some of those lines, um, now back, jailer, back to thy dungeons again to swing the red lash and rivet the chain. That idea of the, the blood being so much a part of the lash um, uh, and the fact that um, uh, this uh, uh, woman who had been in one of these slave jails would prefer death to uh, return back to the jail um, is very telling. Um, there were a series of slave pens uh, located just south of the National Mall um, all throughout the, the decades prior to the Civil War. Um, uh, and um, that neighborhood was selected because of its proximity to um, the uh, Potomac River where um, uh, uh, there, there were these wharves where slaves could be loaded and unloaded and the slave markets that were right there on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, it just downtown Washington DC and coffles of chain slaves passed the US Capitol daily, which was a fact that, that was discussed widely in Northern newspapers. So of course, abolitionists argued that the slave trade disgraced the nation's founding ideals. Um, I think we will, I, I could go on about that poem. I love that poem, but I think I'll leave it there. Yeah, what I'm so struck by about, you know, having read the poem, uh, read it on the page, but really reading it aloud, um, of course is, you know, that the, 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 the voice of poetry is not what we're used to in contemporary poetry, of course, um, and, and, and what then, but yet the poignancy of the poem comes so strongly through in so many of the lines, like it's, it's so visceral to, to, to read it and experience this through the eyes of the poet um, telling us the story you know, telling us of her, of, 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 of this woman's story on the bridge. And I, um, it was just such, it's just such a moving poem to me, even though it, it, it is, it's, it, it's kind of coded in the language of an earlier era of how we hear poetry, but there's something about the rhythm of it that, um, that really, I think lends itself to the urgency and the energy of the poem itself. And again, I, yeah, I found it, I'm so glad I was able to read it and try to do it some justice. And that ecstatic leap, I mean, in some ways at the end, um, what a way to, of course, end the poem. Well, I'm, you know, as we move through further through the anthology, I'm really interested also in these networks that brought African-American and white abolitionist leaders together, you know, as, um, you know, as Grace Greenwood was this white abolitionist, but wanting to do her work to support the movement. And I would love to hear a little bit more about these networks that formed in the in the capital. 
Yeah, um, the the um, as I as I mentioned, the the uh, Bailey's home uh, was certainly one of the the places where that those networks occurred, and um, we have um, anecdotal evidence that it was also a stop on the the um, Underground Railroad. Um, DC developed uh, what is one of the strongest net was one of the strongest networks of African American and white abolitionists in the nation, um, and in response to that growing internal slave trade. Um, the 15th Street Presbyterian Church uh, should be mentioned as a major um, uh, what gathering spot for um, uh, African American and white abolitionists to come together. That was a, a, a church established in 1841. Um, and um, uh, what these networks tried to do was to work together to uh, raise funds to purchase enslaved people out of bondage, uh, to pay legal fees, and to finance escapes through the region's Underground Railroad. Um, so a, a really sort of remarkable uh, group of uh, uh, people working together, um, mostly behind the scenes. Well, we have a poem um, by Gail Hamilton next from the anthology. Would you tell us a little bit about a little bit about her background before before we hear that from Liz All? Sure. And Hamilton is is another one of these these women who came into the Bailey's uh, home as a governess and um, uh, ended up um, becoming a very prominent uh, journalist of her time. She was born in Massachusetts. She came to DC in 1856. Um, and published first in um, The New Era, uh, but then also in uh, several other progressive publications. Um, and uh, her work is always notable for its wit and strong feminist and anti-slavery stances. Well, here's Gail Hamilton's To Dr. Bailey with a Pair of Gloves, Christmas. To Dr. Bailey with a pair of gloves, Christmas. I fear it will seem a Hibernian stroke to mark the sincerest of loves by begloving a man whose great glory it is that he handles all sin without gloves. But remember, I pray, that the glove in old times was a signal of mortal defiance. And in these evil days, if a man can be found on whom Christendom places reliance, who always stands ready to shiver a lance for the love of the right, not renown, it is surely the least his admirers can do to provide him with gloves to throw down. Oh, thanks so much, Liz. That was beautifully read. You know what I really, uh, what I really appreciate about that poem. I really was thinking about this as I'm going to use um, Michael Anthony Ingram's language. Really, a quintessential political poem of the time of that time. And that, and that if, if I think about, you know, what are, the, what are the politics of poetry now, that poem has all the elements of it in it, in addition to what I just think is some extraordinary language as well. But um, I was so struck by that in this poem. Well, that next major theme that we're gonna discuss actually right now for this Juneteenth holiday is developing a, a renewed appreciation for the, of the political, uh, that the role of revolt and activism, which again, I, I kind of see coursing through that poem as tools for the, in the push for civil rights and social justice. So I'd like to have us turn to that, you know, to that theme right now, Kim. In the decades leading up to the Civil War, it was a time when Slaves escapes, rebellions were covered widely in the newspapers, as um, as you've mentioned, and and 
Can you talk a little bit about what is, again, one of the most well-known, that is Nat Turner's rebellion and how that affected lawmakers in the, in the District of Columbia? Yeah, um, so uh, Nat Turner led a rebellion of enslaved Virginians in Southampton County in the Southern part of the state in August of 1831. Uh, Nat Turner was literate, a deeply religious lay minister and from all accounts, a charismatic and natural leader. Uh, although the rebellion was suppressed after a few days, a group of approximately 70 fighters went from house to house, freeing enslaved people and killing approximately 60 white people using revolutionary violence to awaken whites to the brutality of slaveholding. The subsequent white retaliation inflamed the national debate about slavery and state legislatures across the country enacted new laws prohibiting the education of people of color, restricting rights of assembly, and requiring white ministers to be present at all worship services for enslaved people. Nat Turner's rebellion brought the controversial subject of African-American self-emancipation into the national discussion. Without question, it hastened the onsite, uh, onset of the Civil War. Um, so there's this terrific poem that I love uh, in the anthology by T. Thomas Fortune that memorializes Nat Turner. Um, just a, a, a few words by, by way of introduction. T. Thomas Fortune, another uh, name that I, I wish all Americans knew. Um, he would become best known as the editor of uh, the New York Age, the leading African-American newspaper in the US from the 1880s to the early 1900s. But he got a start in Washington, DC, uh, attending Howard University, although never graduating, and taking his first job as a reporter at the People's Advocate newspaper. I couldn't agree with you more about really our need to know, you know, know the, the voice and poetry of T. Thomas Fortune more. Definitely needs to be uh, in the anthologies so that carried forward. And today, Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram will be reading T. Thomas Fortune's Nat Turner. He stood erect, a man as proud as ever to be a tyrant bowed, unwilling head or bent a knee, and long while bending to be free. In all his ebon features came a shadow, t'was of manly shame, a shame that he should wear a chain and feel his manhood writhe with pain. Doomed to a life of plotting tall, shamefully rooted to the soil. He stood erect, his eyes flashed fire, his robust form convulsed with ire. I will be free, I will be free, or fighting die a man, cried he. Virginia's bills were lit at night. The slave had risen in his might, and far and near next well went forth to south and east and west and north, and strong men trembled in their power, and weak men felt towards now their hour, I will be free, I will be free, of fighting a dire man, cried he. The tyrant's arm was all too strong, had swayed dominion all too long. And so the hero met his end, as all who fall as freedom's friend. The blow he struck shook slavery's throne. His cause was just and skeptic's own. And round his lowly grave soon swarmed, freedom's brave host for freedom's arm. That host was swollen by Nat's kin to fight for freedom, freedom win. Upon the soul that spurned his cry, I will be free or I will die. Let tyrants quake, even in their power, for sure will come the awful hour when they must give an answer why heroes in chains should basely die instead of rushing to the field and counting battles ere they yield. Ah, thank you. What, that's so great to hear that in your voice. Um, just uh, the uh, amazing use uh, that, that uh, T. Thomas Fortune made of that uh, refrain line, I will be free, I will be free, or fighting die a man, cried he. Uh, just such, such strong, such angry, strong, 
powerful words, let tyrants quake even in their power, for sure will come the awful hour when they must give an answer why heroes in chains should basely die. It's just a, amazing words. Yeah, I, I, in, in, I, in hearing that, again, it's so obviously it's always so different to hear it in the voice, but nothing like hearing it in um, Michael Anthony's Ingram's voice. I also couldn't help but feel like that echo of that line, I will be free, I will be free, you know, brought me right up to the 60s and hearing Dr. Martin Luther King as well. Um, and, and, and the oratory, the oratory of the poetry um, playing itself out and, and the necessity and the urgency of it. Well, the other, um, you know, the other major abolitionist rebellion at the time to make national news, of course, was led by John Brown in 1859. And I will just anecdotally say this, I've always um, felt a connection to the John Brown story and have always studied it and always paid attention to it because my grandfather was also a John, was John Brown. So whenever I heard the story of the rebellion, you know, as a, as a little kid, I was always think I, you know, it, it always made my grandfather John Brown. So I always perked up whenever I heard about the rebellion of 1859. Well, John Brown's trial um, made him a hero for the Union cause. And um, although his raid was conducted with only 22 men, they gained access to the US arsenal at Harper's Ferry and took hostages. Um, his aim to promote the insurrection of enslaved Americans and to bring on the Civil War was successful even though the raid itself was not successful. Um, and uh, the next poem we're, we're looking at, uh, Georgia Douglas Johnson wrote a, a tribute to Brown that I've, I love. Um, uh, Georgia Douglas Johnson is a, a hero of mine. Um, she was one of the best published women authors of the Harlem Renaissance period. She worked for the US Department of Labor uh, in Washington, DC hosted weekly salons in her home throughout the 1920s um, and then more sporadically, but uh, all the way up through the 1940s, she was hosting salons. Uh, she was the author of uh, four books of poems, six plays, 32 song lyrics. She wrote a newspaper column that was syndicated to 20 newspapers. Uh, she was just amazing. Um, so um, this is her poem to John Brown. And so appropriately, another amazing poet to read the poem to John Brown. Terry Cross Davis reading Georgia Douglas, reading Georgia Douglas Johnson's to John Brown. To John Brown. We lift a song to you across the day which bears through travailing the seed you spread in terror's morning flung with fingers red and blood of tyrants who debarred the way to freedom's dawning. Hearken to the lay chanted by dusky millions, soft and mellow keyed in minor measure, martyr of the freed, a song of memory across the day. Truth cannot perish, though the earth erase the royal signals, leaving not a trace, and time still burgeoneth the fertile seed, though he is crucified who wrought the deed. O oh, Alleghenies, fold him to your breasts until the judgment sentinel his rest. Thank you, Terry. Um, I too love that poem. I mean, you just, first of all, you just chose beautiful poems. And of course we have amazing people reading them today. Um, thank you, Terry. Well, let's move on to talk about what is always an important aspect 
of the conversation around um, historical trauma, which is the I, which is the theme, um, the third theme in our conversation here for the Juneteenth holiday, about how we look at the history of civil rights activism and use it as this launching point to advocate and discuss um, reparations and also knowing that um, in the in the Chicago area earlier this year, um, there was again a borough that uh, that that did vote for reparations, and so this has been a long-standing issue, um, and continues to be. Right. Um, so I, I want to read from uh, another source wiser than than I. Um, According to an article by Nicole Hannah-Jones published in June of last year in the New York Times Magazine. Today, black Americans remain the most segregated group of people in America and are five times as likely to live in high poverty neighborhoods as white Americans. Not even high earnings inoculate black people against racialized disadvantage. Black families earning $75,000 or more a live a, a more or a year live seventy five thousand dollars or more a year live in poorer white neighborhoods than white Americans earning less than forty thousand dollars a year. The average black family with children holds just one cent of wealth for every dollar that the average white family with children holds. Uh, and then the author reminds us, slavery and the 100 year period of racial apartheid and racial terrorism known as Jim Crow were above all else systems of economic exploitation. This shouldn't be controversial. Uh, it's, it's not enough to simply pass laws ending discrimination or pass laws making new hol federal holidays. The government mm -hmm. needs to make cash payments to any American who can prove dissent from an enslaved person. Our government has a history of helping white Americans own land through such programs as the Homestead Act, when the government gave away 246 million acres in 160 acre tracts to white Americans. But look at the re government's record for African Americans. We abruptly ended reconstruction in the South and allowed post-slavery versions of slavery to take place that included poll taxes, sharecropping, and convict leasing programs. African-Americans were denied the opportunities to accumulate wealth through nine decades of lynching, denied entry into union jobs, and by redlining, a program which began with the New Deal that resulted in making houses located in traditionally Black neighborhoods uninsurable. From 1934 to 1962, 98% of FHA loans went to white Americans. If our government can systematically build a white middle class, they can do the same for an African American middle class. Representative John Conyers of Michigan and Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas have been trying for three decades to pass HR 40, a bill to study the issue of reparations, just to study the issue, and it still has never made it out of committee. This time is long past for a, a national record reckoning with our history of slavery. And uh, my hope is that making Juneteenth a federal holiday is merely the symbolic beginning. That cannot be the end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was thinking so much about you know, the Juneteenth holiday, you know, as in some ways, the thing that the government could do and all the things that it hasn't done and that this, that, that this much must be the, you know, the, the gateway to uh, legislation that, that does do that work of, 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 of creating, you know, of creating all kinds of, all kinds of equity. And I, I mean, I can't emphasize enough if, if what you said, that if the government 
can systematically build a white middle class, then it can do the same for uh, definitely for African Americans instead of continuously having policies that are disproportionate uh, all across uh, housing, banking, every kind of every kind of law imaginable um, in the country. Well, you also are writing about in the anthology um, that there was one group that did in fact get reparations. Well, yeah, uh, and, and this is a story that also I think is, is not widely enough known. Um, the only place where reparations were ever distributed was Washington DC and they went to the wrong side. On April 16th, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the District of Columbia Emancipation Act. The law provided compensation to slave owners who could prove their loyalty to the union in exchange for freeing their slaves. A board of three appointees evaluated each case and dispersed funds to white slave owners. Over 3,000 people were freed. Now, why did this happen? Because DC was and still continues to be seen as a, a sort of proving ground for new uh, experimenting with new uh, ideas that might go national. So uh, Abraham Lincoln was thinking, well, this might be one way to end slavery. Um, as a result, uh, enslaved people in Washington DC were freed first in the nation, which is fantastic, of course, but the money that the government paid out to <laughs> the immoral white enslavers, rather than giving that money to the people who had their forced labor had uh, uh, been given for free for their lifetimes is just outrageous. You know, this this um, also kind of brings me brings me pause to the fact that again a reminder of why these poems in the anthology, you know, written at these written at these times in in the early years. Of the capital are so and are so important um, to because they are not um, you know in contemporary poetry now it is it is it is very difficult to have poetry that the general public is reading and at the time this was true of the the poetry that we've been amplifying today. So these poems were not just poems that were tucked away. These were poems that were in the public discourse. And this is um, reminding me of our next poem by Reverend Henry McNeil Turner, a poem called One Year Ago Today. Would you talk a little bit about the significance of that poem at the time and the, and the legacy of that poem? Yeah, so this is a poem that, that was read um, April 16th, 1863 at the 15th Street Presbyterian Church. And it was reprinted in another abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. And it commemorates DC's special status as the first place slavery was officially ended and the only place where white slave owners were compensated financially. Nine months before the Emancipation Proclamation took effect, over 3000 people held in bondage in DC became the nation's first breed. So uh, the Reverend Henry McNeil Turner uh, uh, wrote, I think very movingly about this. Um, I guess I should tell you a little bit more about him, another poet who uh, has sort of been lost to time. Um, he was the 12th consecrated Bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, born free in South Carolina, um, self-educated uh, until he enrolled in Trinity College in Baltimore. Um, and then led pastorates in St. Louis, Baltimore, DC, and Savannah, Georgia. Um, he was appointed by President Abraham Lincoln to serve as the first African-American chaplain to the US colored troops during the Civil War. Um, in DC, he led the Union Bethel Church. Um, so maybe we can, we can hear some of his words. Well, this is, Reverend Henry McNeil Turner's One Year Ago Today. 
Almighty God, we praise thy name. For having heard, we pray. For having freed us from our chains one year ago today. We thank thee for thy arm has stayed, foul despotism sway, and made Columbia's district free one year ago today. Give us the power to withstand oppression's baleful fray that right may triumph as it did one year ago today. Give liberty to millions yet meet despotism's sway that they praise thee as we did one year ago today. Oh, guide us safely through this storm. Bless Lincoln's gentle sway and then we'll ever praise thee as one year ago today. Again, I love that that refrain, um, which would have um, uh, made the, the poem uh, more memorable, more easy to memorize. Um, uh, it could the poem could then be easily um, put to music, uh, which it was. Um, and um, certainly the formerly enslaved residents of DC uh, felt that they had a, a particular um, uh, what destiny because as first freed um, they needed to what uh, show that um, uh, they they were able to be self-sustaining after the end of slavery um, and so uh, there's great pride among descendants of those first freed uh, in DC and you could really, really hear that in the voice of the poem, uh, you know, the, the, the way that run through the poem, through that refrain, particularly in the way that, um, that Michael shared the poem, just so, um, so moving, so absolutely moving. Well, that, um, you know, that kind of, that, that kind of need to echo that theme um, of, of kind of, you know, honoring that um, can leads me to think also about the movement in addition for DC statehood, the connection that the, the connection that can be made between reparations and then historically, how does that connect to that idea of DC itself becoming a state? Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the, the, the opportunity to do a little advocating here. Um, since 1801, the US Constitution has mandated that Congress holds exclusive legislation over a government district, but they never took into account the rights of the residents living in that district. The, the law has changed several times since the found, city's founding in 1800, allowing for limited voting rights, but here's where we stand now. DC residents can vote for city council members and a, and a mayor, but we have no voting representatives in Congress. And almost more importantly, Congress controls our budget. So all city legislation must get congressional approval, which is never a given. Um, the latest census shows that the city of Washington, DC has a larger population than two states, Vermont and Wyoming. But we have no voting representative in Congress, the very definition of taxation without representation. Uh, each time the issue of expanding voting rights has come up in the city's history, racism has been the excuse to keep citizens from gaining a vote. In 1890, Senator John Morgan of Alabama stated it most clearly. He said that the history of black citizens voting was quote, so abominable and disgraceful that Congress needed to burn down the barn to get rid of the rats the rats being the Negro population and the barn being the government of the District of Columbia. In January, 2021, DC's esteemed non-voting delegate to the house, the Honorable Eleanor Holmes Norton introduced HR 51, the Washington DC Admission Act to make DC a state. Uh, the measure passed the house. Uh, it is not expected to pass in the Senate. Uh, this is the second year in a row this has happened. Under the proposed legislation, the federal district would shrink to a two square mile enclave, including the US Capitol and the White House. The rest of the city, the residential and commercial areas would become the state of Washington, Douglas Commonwealth, named to honor former DC resident, Frederick Douglas. 
Uh, DC residents pay more in taxes than residents in 22 states. DC residents serve in the military and on juries. Under the CARES Act, which provided funds for coronavirus relief, DC was denied the same emergency funds as states. But since our population is currently 47% African-American and always votes heavily Democratic, Republican senators believe that fixing the historic inequality and restoring equal citizenship to capital residents would mean ceding power nationally. Representative James Comer of Kentucky said the legislation is only about Democrats consolidating their power in Washington. But that's not how democracy works. How you would vote cannot be a test of whether they should have the right to vote. This is a civil rights issue. If DC became a state, it would have the largest proportion of African-American voters of any state in the nation. Statehood for DC would represent a step toward real structural democracy reform. Yeah, I appreciate again, um, that bringing up the issue of structural, you know, the, the, the structural racism embedded in, um, in all these systems. And uh, it, it, you and I had a conversation before we put this program together. We, um, and, and we just, we knew, we know that DC statehood is, uh, is quite a controversial issue as reparations are, and yet, all we did, what your book does takes us back and historically brings us right up to the present to see the thread of how these issues continue to have a deep economic, psychological impact on our residents of DC and African American brothers and sisters and how important it is to keep these issues like in the limelight and um, and advocating that I mean again I, I think about I keep thinking about from last week Miss Opal Lee and all that she did to bring Juneteenth to a holiday. The holiday, not the not the laws that then would actually in, enact what needs to be enacted to create fruit, to create a more perfect union, a more perfect union. Yeah, it's just it's so, just it's just the start of the conversation. Just the start of the conversation. And again, what I so appreciate is your book bringing the poetry from the past to show how absolutely pertinent it is to our present conversation. And so I'd love to, to have you tell us a little bit about the next poem that we'll hear. And it's just, it's, it's again, such a, a visceral, powerful poem that I could hear anytime. And again, um, I'm not just thinking of these poems as historical, I'm thinking of them as absolutely necessary in the present. And this is a poem by the Reverend John Sella Martin. Um, and uh, this is, this is the, the final poem that I, I wanted to present and, and you'll soon see why. Um, uh, uh, John Sella Martin uh, escaped slavery in Alabama in 1856 and made his way to Boston where he became a minister and a celebrated orator. Um, he moved to Washington DC in 1869 where he was the well-loved pastor of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, one of the leading abolitionist churches in the nation, um, one that I've, I've mentioned earlier. Uh, in addition to sermons, uh, John Sella Martin wrote journalism and poetry. He briefly edited the New Era newspaper um, and uh, this is his poem, The Sentinel of Freedom. <sighs> Gary Copeland Lilly. Sentinel Reading. of Freedom. Um, 
Watchman, what of the night? The storm has begun, the thunders are pealing, the lightnings of truth like the stern flashing eye of justice that sleeps now of vengeance unfeeling are bursting from clouds in their conflict on high. The, the winds of this discussion like the plowshares of terror sink deep neath the surface of slavery's dead sea. And the monsters of crime on the billows of error appear to be, be appear to the horrified gaze of the free. The weepings of mercy in showers are falling on slavery's grim altars to dampen their blaze. The deep tones of progress like trumpets are calling to red revolution, who fiercens his gaze. The earthquakes of interest are shaking with fury, the groves and high places of tyranny's power. And molten free speech like lava will bury its temples and altars to rise nevermore. Now stern agitation, all sleepless and busy, throws open the floodgates of feelings deep sea. And the swift rushing torrents make, make nations grow dizzy, and they leap over dams built to check their wild glee. The merciless whirlwinds of God's indignation are sweeping through Earth's disenthrall from their cave. And reason, all quenchless in bright conflagration, is melting the chains from the limbs of the slave. The champions of slavery in wild desperation are cutting their flesh as, as the all potent charm and pouring their blood as the needed libation to this raft to appease and their, their terrors to calm. The truth crushing genie of policy is waving his hand of corruption to silence the roar and the great fish of mammon, his Jonas, are saving from watery destruction to die on the shore. The altars of bondage are blazing with fire. The slave in his chains is, is its gr gr grim sacrifice. The tones of the priest rise higher and higher, but his God now in conflict regards not his cries. The merchant in fear brings his gift to the altar. The statesman and the jurist bring laws all in vain. The demagogue's accents in doubt begins to falter, though union is sounded again and again. But all is in vain, the heavens grow thicker with portents of dread to oppression's weak soul. And almighty truth flashes brighter and quicker while terrific reason is in thunders a row. The earthquake is shattering their prisons to pieces amid the eruptions of volcanic, of volcanic speech while whirlwinds and torrents in fury increases though tyrants alternately curse and beseech. And thus shall it be until freedom shall cover with an ocean of light our nation so dark, till justice and mercy unite, united shall hover over man who is untrampled in liberty's ark. Then neath truth's great sunlight by conflict unfaded and earth renovated by fire and flood, shall man in his majesty stand undergraded the Lord of creation, the image of God. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary Copeland, Lily. Again, reading John Sella Martin's The Sentinel of Freedom. Well, I'm after hearing all these poems that you've curated for this collection, Kim, 
again, I, I continue to just be very moved by how the language carries forward to the present time. You know, even though some of the phrasing and some of the language might not be that familiar to the contemporary ear, but certain, but 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 it is it, like it's it's still it's still those syllables still ring through and and um, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about what it means to be a literary historian of Washington D.C. Um, as well as obviously a poet and um, really hear what that truly means to you to carry this work forward in time. Well, I, I, I do, um, I am very much inspired by the, these voices from the past. And, and I agree with you that we, we build our literature uh, on the shoulders of those who came before us. Um, I would say, you know, historians traditionally use factual rather than creative works as their primary texts. And this seems like a huge mistake to me. This, uh, I think it's really important that we look at that practice. Um, most historians rely on factual records like the census, birth and death records, marriage certificates, what, immigration records, military records. Um, and combine that with newspaper reports and court records. Um, uh, sometimes they, they might fill out uh, uh, some information with private sources like diaries or letters, but you don't generally see poems used in that, that same way. Um, I, I think historians are suspicious of imaginative works uh, and this seems profoundly strange to me. Um, we know that, that people have always turned to poetry at times of great emotion to help them voice their grief, um, to um, uh, celebrate their heroes, to uh, talk about uh, uh, how they've fallen in love. Um, that, that poetry is used to commemorate some of our most significant life cycle events, but also some of our most significant national events. And it gives us access to the emotional life of our forebears in ways that these factual dry records simply can't. Um, I wanted to put together this collection as a way of making that history, our shared American history come alive in, in ways that are deeper and more nuanced than the dry factual records. Well, I think that no one today who's been with us would, uh, would, uh, would argue against the fact that you have done exactly that which you set out to do in bringing these poems um, forward into our present consciousness as a way to link us to the significant legacy that that, that is our nation's history as seen through the lens of um, Washington, DC. I just want to make sure, do you have a final poem for us to close out mm. today? Um, huh. Well, I, I, I was sort of uh, hoping that, that um, the, this last poem that Gary read uh, would, would be the, the final word. Um, uh, and I hadn't really prepared another one, but um, huh. uh, let me take a quick look at the book and say, um, oh, <laughs> um, I, I don't know, who should I pick? Um, Frederick Douglass is in here. Um, uh, wow. Okay. Um, How to pick just I'm, one? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick one by another um, 
Harlem Renaissance era writer um, who is not well known, who deserves to be better known. Um, and her name is Esther Popel Shaw. And um, she um, uh, uses the text of the Pledge of Allegiance in a, uh, uh, interwoven with uh, this poem uh, in a way that I think is very, very modern. This is called Flag Salute by Esther Popelshaw. I pledge allegiance to the flag. They dragged him naked through the muddy streets, a feeble-minded black boy, and the charge supposed assault upon an aged woman of the United States of America. One mile they dragged him like a a rope around his neck, bloody ear left dangling by the patriotic hand of Nordic youth, a boy of 17, and to the Republic for which it stands. And then they hanged his body to a tree below the window of the county judge whose pleadings for that battered human flesh were stifled by the brutish, raucous howls of men and boys and women with their babes, brought out to see the bloody spectacle of murder in the style of 33. 3,000 strong they were, one nation indivisible. To make a tale complete, they built a fire. What matters that the stuff they burned was flesh and bone and hair and reeking gasoline with liberty and justice, they cut the rope in bits and passed them out for souvenirs among the men and boys. The teeth, no doubt, on golden chains will hang about the favored necks of sweethearts, wives, and daughters, mothers, sisters, babies too, for all. Thank you, Kim Roberts for oh. ending us with um, Esther's poem today. And I, before I just um, make a few final remarks, I would just like to invite um, folks to unmute and, and show your gratitude for, um, for, for Kim Roberts, as well as our readers today we heard from Liz All, Michael Anthony Ingram, Terry Cross Davis, and Gary Lilly. Please unmute. Thank you so very much. Thank everyone. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing My program. 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 Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Extraordinary. Keep it. <laughs> I want again um, share with you make today for our G Juneteenth program. The book is the extraordinary anthology. And dare I remind you, it's not just about the history of the of DC. I mean, it is, <laughs> but it is so 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 much more than that. The book is by Broad Potomac's. Sure, great poems from the early days of our nation's capital, edited by Kim by Kim Roberts from the University of Virginia Press. You have the you have the link in the chat. I mean, here is a book that you want to have with you for every Juneteenth moving forward. For every Juneteenth moving forward. Because these poems um, continue, these poems by, we heard by Grace Greenwood, Gail Hamilton, and Thomas, T. Thomas Fortune, and the Reverend Henry McNeil Turner, Georgia Johnson, and the Reverend John Sella Martin. These poems were the docu-poetics poems of their day. They were the docu-poetics poems of their day, and they still speak volumes in our present moment. So I really urge, again, I can't thank Kim enough for bringing all of us together to explore um, 
the legacy of Juneteenth that continues today. And what better way than to do it with poetry? That's, 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 that's what our lens is. That's what everyone in this room often uses. I'm reminded of um, also Muriel Rue Kaiser. I'm reminded of when she says, in times of crisis, we summon our strength. I'm thinking so much about Audre Lorde um, talking about the master's tools and the master's house and what that means in her essays in Sister Outsider. And here's another extraordinary anthology of history and power um, and just beautiful language. The, the image is so visceral, um, so powerful and so, so incredibly rendered today from our guest poets. Thank you all so very, very much on the day after Juneteenth. And I want to encourage people that if you have any upcoming readings or announcements, this might be a good time to put those in the chat for those of us in the audience here. And I have a reminder now to invite you to join us back here next Sunday for our second annual Poetry Pride Parade. We will be featuring Mancho Alvarado, Kai Coggin, Charlie Dale, Ann Walsh Donnelly, Charles Flowers, Gustavo Hernandez, Karen Poppy, Minnie Bruce Pratt, Julie Marie Wade, Mark Ward, plus our live open mic with all of you. I hope you'll come back next week. You can always register for all of our readings on our event pages on Facebook to join us live here in Zoom or watch us live from our Facebook group page. Again, I can't, I cannot, uh, I cannot thank Kim Roberts and Liz All, Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram, Terry Cross Davis, and Gary Lilly for joining us today to share the extraordinary poetry and lend their voices to this most significant of um, conversations uh, and conflicts. You know, the, 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 uh, the way, the prismatic way that poetry allows us to look at many, many sides of things. Also, thanks to Don Krieger for helping us produce today's show and to Kim Ports Parsons for helping us promote the event for today. Um, our humanity, of course, depends on all of us, whatever race, creed, ethnicity we are practicing and encouraging all of us to do our deep work and our deep listening of one another. I wanna encourage you all that please take very good care of yourselves and your beloveds. And of course, everybody keep writing. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.